Orientalism was a book published by Edward Said in the 1970s, and it took the world by storm in a way that uh, was highly unexpected. Here was a guy looking at paintings, and by looking at specific paintings from the 19th century, he was able to identify a way of telling stories, a way we have told stories to ourselves in the West that uh, develops further beyond simply uh, the harmless views of entertainment, uh, entertaining stories or beautiful paintings, uh, but actually into a larger justification for a world system uh, and a world view that justifies uh, larger activities such as colonialism. And so Edward Said uh, leapt onto the world stage as a public intellectual uh, shedding light on topics that are uncomfortable, uh, continue to be uncomfortable to the present day for many people. Um, this is a typical passage uh, that he makes the point, he makes the connection but not just between paintings, but uh, in much of his later work, especially about literature, in which he makes the point that uh, Western authors, in this case Flaubert, uh, narrates the story in a way that doesn't just uh, assert power, but it demonstrates power, in this case, power of the author over his uh, uh, the romantic involvement he has with an Egyptian woman and um, consolidates an image of women, especially oriental women, orientalized women, as being uh, silent and without power, without agency, uh, which is a term you'll hear bandied about in architecture schools, the, the issue of agency. Uh, but here is a character without agency, and so it is up to the white male European to speak for her. And this is the classic uh, trope of the Orientalist uh, analysis of uh, culture. And uh, here we see uh, one of the paintings that uh, Said uh, examines at length that depicts uh, the Orientalist uh, sheik uh, lying back on the divan uh, on the bed and um, just depicts a, a portrayal of debauchery, of violence, of excess, of gluttony, of laziness that becomes uh, a powerful image of the uh, stereotypical uh, orientalized leader and the culture, the power, the relationships, um, the nature of the of the Orient, um, and so it's depicted through a whole series of very popular paintings. So it becomes an entire tradition of painting in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, by European painters, um, including paintings of the tropical islands. Um, uh, and it often involves the, the sexualization of uh, women and uh, others uh, in these in the depictions. Uh, and it is a very much a judgment uh, that is undergirding a, a situation of power. Uh, and in this, we touch on the idea of discourse. And um, Michel Foucault is a French philosopher who lived uh, for in the, and was active in the late 19, uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and left a very deep uh, footprint. Uh, left was very important to architects. You may have heard of him uh, in relationship to his analysis of prisons and how the panopticon arrangement of prisons with one guard at the center being able to uh, keep an eye on the, on the many, many prisoners on the edges. And then the further innovation of making the watchtower uh, something with slits, with viewports, so that the prisoners can't tell if they're being looked at. Uh, 
The prisoners can't even tell if someone is in the guard post. And so the sense of being under constant surveillance is one of the powerful operations of uh, the architectural arrangement of prisons. And this idea has been ex extended to the operation of surveillance cameras uh, in public space. Uh, Mike Davis uh, looking at Los Angeles um, and how surveillance has transformed our relationship and the operation of public space in terms of uh, the operations of power and control. And so Foucault has also uh, extended these ideas into how we control the way people think. And uh, this is in part uh, through the control of what vocabulary gets applied to certain issues, uh, the language, uh, the issue of how language is used and, and how it, language itself has an impact on what we are capable of thinking. Some of you may have heard of a man by the name of George Orwell, the author of uh, 1984. Uh, George Orwell was uh, very much a pioneer of this way of thinking, in some ways much more effective than Michel Foucault uh, in terms of his analysis of language. Uh, but Foucault takes it further and uh, has made it um, made significant contributions to the idea of how discourse works. And discourse is another word that we throw around in architecture. We talk about architectural discourse. And it's uh, the control of the vocabulary, the control of the language, the control of the words we use is very much a way of controlling what we think, what we are capable of thinking. Uh, and so the control of discourse is a very important uh, idea uh, that comes directly back to uh, what Edward Said has done with his book Orientalism and in the reading for this week, uh, Culture and Imperialism. And the context of this is really uh, the world of uh, the colonial control of territories beyond the boundaries of Europe, uh, the control by European powers of territories far beyond the boundaries. And here's a map of the continent of Africa, which is very telling uh, in terms of the larger forces operating in the 20th century. The uh, meeting, uh, there was a meeting called by the King of Belgium, King Leopold, he decided to uh, get the leaders of the European nations together in Berlin in 1883. And at that meeting, they basically came to an agreement that they had to get their act together and establish the rules of engagement for determining who would control what colonies overseas. And so uh, from that point onward, the European powers were dispatched armies uh, to Africa and Asia, but Africa is a particularly telling situation, to establish uh, relationships with local indigenous leaders uh, that would establish them as uh, a colonial holding of the European nations. Sometimes these negotiations were uh, with a great deal of force, such as um, killing anyone who stood in their way. Sometimes it was negotiated through uh, exchanges of wealth. But one way or another, uh, in the next three decades, by 1913, uh, the continent of Africa had basically been divvied up amongst uh, these various global powers Belgium controlled the Congo at the very center of the continent. Germany had rather modest holdings uh, relative to others. Uh, Spain um, also um, fairly modest, but it was the French, uh, the vast areas of northwest Africa were controlled by France. The British, uh, seen in uh, pink, controlled a great deal 
of the continent. The Italians uh, tried their hand at controlling Libya, uh, parts of Eritrea and, and um, Somalia, and uh, Portugal maintaining a, a, a footprint as well. And so by 1913, the continent had basically been divided up. Um, one of the problems with maps like this is that it is, gives a false impression of uh, absolute control and homogeneous control of these large colored areas. Uh, it would be much more precise and much more useful to look at where the people actually are and um, establish points and lines. Uh, the points and lines depiction of this map would be much more useful. Um, maybe someday we'll have that. But the idea uh, in this context, the European control of these other areas were justified by a moral imperative that there was a civilizing mission. And this term, civilizing mission, was promoted very much by the French that um, uh, the idea was the European powers and European civilization, quote unquote, needed to be imposed from above uh, by those with great power in Europe in order to save these people from themselves. They were underdeveloped, they need, needed to be developed. And you could almost just as easily uh, state this in the present tense because we continue to use the language of developmentalism, which is the idea that there are developed societies and underdeveloped societies. And it is the mission of the developed societies to help uh, speed along the inevitable of the underdeveloped societies developing, moving along that, uh, that track, that journey from underdevelopment to development, from uncivilized to becoming civilized. And so the imagery portrayed in the paintings were also uh, proliferated through photography uh, with its rise in the late 19th century. And this is clearly um, a falsified scene with a painted backdrop, um, but very much uh, a constructed depiction of a kind of laziness, uh, downward cast eyes, submissiveness, uh, a, a people ready to be subjugated, and um, an, almost an obligation to subjugate these people, given the decadence uh, as depicted um, by this painting by Delacroix, um, the great French Orientalist painter. Uh, and so there are lingering questions of how these divides uh, came to be. And um, this issue of thresholds coming out of MIT in the 1990s uh, look at a series of questions about what does it mean to be Asian? What does it mean to be Japanese? What does it mean to be Indian? What does it mean to be Chinese, uh, et cetera? So through the series of uh, examinations, um, really looking at that question of what does it mean to be Asian and how that has changed over time. Um, this is uh, one of the responses. In a way, it's a caricature of um, a worldview that uh, draws a very sharp distinction between us and them, between European uh, powers uh, that are civilized and developed and others. And often in this literature, the, the word uh, other is used very deliberately to be critical of this sharp distinction between us and them, between uh, us and the other, and often used in quotes. And so the, uh, in here, the characteristics of the other are summarized as being savage, infantile, mystical, uh, and subject to sexual perversion. Uh, and so this story is embedded, as uh, Said uh, points out, in the production of art, uh, in the literature um, that deals with uh, 
the interface between Europeans and the other elsewhere, and uh, and also uh, in architecture, um, although he doesn't get into architecture, but it's very much a part of uh, the way this story is constructed. Uh, and mapping is also a part of this. Uh, the background of this, going back a little bit further in history, is the classic um, historic struggle and competition between the European powers and the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire uh, was an Islamic uh, empire that grew out of um, the spread of Islam from the Arabian Peninsula uh, outward, uh, eventually uh, subsuming um, what is currently Spain and the Iberian Peninsula uh, for hundreds of years. And um, the constant fear of the Ottoman armies marching on uh, Vienna uh, in the western boundary of European civilization. And so the walled cities of Europe were walled because of the need to defend against the armies of the Ottoman Empire marching uh, into Europe. And some would say that uh, the, the crucial moment of truth was in 1683 when um, Vienna was facing imminent defeat um, by the Ottoman Empire, uh, but was saved by um, the last minute onslaught of forces from Poland that came down and saved Vienna from falling. Had Vienna fallen, uh, much of Europe would have subsequently fallen to the Ottoman Empire. So that was, in a way, a moment of truth uh, that loomed large in European consciousness for centuries ever since. Whether we know the story or not, uh, it seems to still be uh, part of the subconscious understanding of competition between um, world forces and global forces. Uh, moving on from the early spread of Islam, Asia was characterized by um, empires. And as always, I encourage you to take these boundaries with a great deal of uh, grains of salt. It never plays out this neatly. Um, control is really a matter of, uh, is subject to the conditions of transportation, communication, and human settlement. So a more precise mapping would um, trace the boundaries of rivers and river systems, uh, which were the primary primary mode of navigation, and that control would have been much stronger along these uh, waterways, uh, the coastlines, the river systems into the inlands, and uh, on some occasions the road systems, although these were quite uh, underdeveloped. Um, and so we see some of these overland routes uh, that operated in addition to the sea routes. But this is a map of um, an early uh, establishment of trade relationships um, that ran east and west primarily. And uh, with the, the famous Silk Road uh, highways, uh, trade routes, that there was increasing over the march of time, increasing contact between east and west, and most uh, pr prominently uh, in the spice trades, uh, which Europeans were willing to pay a great deal of money for spices given the conditions of, uh, of the difficulties of preserving meats uh, for consumption uh, at later times. So the spice trade was dominant um, when the, uh, the Silk Road trade routes were shut down um, through hostility of local tribes. The sea routes rose, and uh, for several centuries, uh, the, the Muslim traders uh, came into the ports of Europe, primarily uh, the port of Venice, uh, creating a great deal of uh, concentrated wealth in Venice, and thus 
making possible a great deal of what we know as the Renaissance, also motivating uh, the Crusades uh, and the great expansion of European uh, exploration to try to seize control, to find alternative access to the spice trade um, that ultimately uh, was successful starting in about 1500. But throughout, it was an issue of uh, justifying this control, not just uh, as a, a trade war issue, but also a matter of bringing civilization to the under-civilized, the underdeveloped uh, hordes of Asia. And so here you see uh, the uh, early explorers from distinct countries, the Portuguese, were among the first to um, master the technologies of uh, long distance ocean vessels. And so they had a big head start in much of Asia uh, in terms of spreading their reach and establishing trade relationships throughout the Indian Ocean and up through the South China Sea uh, that were shortly followed by Spain, the Dutch, the French, uh, and the British. And, um, and so this really was uh, the focus of a great deal of energy uh, and, the great, uh, and wealth and investment that led to the expansion of uh, the, the world as we know it. And so um, moving on in time, we start to see uh, proliferation of trade routes, uh, the establishment of trade relationships, and the establishment of the colonies uh, along these routes. And here we see a juxtaposition of the transportation networks, the cities, and the uh, fledgling establishment of larger entities that eventually evolved into becoming the nation states as we know them on the map today. But again, these maps uh, are deceptive in presenting a picture of uniformity within their boundaries uh, to a system that was anything but uniform. And so we continue this story to uh, the present situation where we have high concentrations of population that are unevenly distributed around these nation, so-called nation states. And you can start to see that it is anything but uniform that the actual the demographic reality of this geography is that people are located and uh, in very differing concentrations. Um, and in the area of our greatest interest, uh, we see the river valleys of, the, uh, of northeastern India. We see the, the south east coastline of China and up through the Pearl River Valley, um, parts of Tokyo, uh, I mean parts of Japan, especially around Tokyo, around the coastline, and then the island of Java. These are the places where a vast majority of humanity are concentrated. And so even as we will continue to look at maps that block out these large shapes colored on uh, the depiction of the surface of the planet, we should keep in mind that these populations, these forces, these societies are disproportionately concentrated and increasingly concentrated in very specific small places at very high densities, much higher densities than anything we have experienced in North America. And so it really is uh, a matter of the operation of cities of Asia that are the determining historical forces of how things have and will continue to play out and the connections between these high concentrations. So it is a matter of points of cities, lines of transportation, sometimes that's rivers, sometimes that's roads, some increasingly it's air travel and rail. and so. It's a point line geometry. It's not a matter of these large uh, colored shapes on the map. And uh, the large colored shapes on the maps 
are present a distorted portrayal of reality that there are boundaries and that the Orient is bounded by these lines away from uh, the Occident, which is uh, the uh, other term uh, for the West. The West and the East are our maps and our language and our cultural uh, manifestations, our constructs, give a false impression of a bounded condition. The reality is much more complex. Uh, the geometry is not one of colored shapes with hard and fast boundaries. It is a geometry of points and lines and a great deal of mixing uh, all the way through. And so um, this the world continues to unfold uh, according to this overarching narration. The narrative of modern development uh, is very much the inheritance of colonial arrangements. The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the entire complex of international aid, um, the technical planning and design of the infrastructures continue to be underpinned and undergirded uh, by these attitudes of us and them of the inevitable march forward of history from underdevelopment to development and that uh, the role of architecture in all of this is at as is very central to the operation of the playing out of this story and so uh, the uh, discourse that undergirds the profession of architecture is very much uh, the descendant from uh, this idea of uh, of development and at its root is uh, the type of discourse analysis uh, that uh, Foucault and Said present to us. It helps us see things uh, with greater clarity and now that uh, through these lenses you can start to see the micro operation of these attitudes in uh, the lines we draw. As the pencil hits the paper, you can see the manifestation of some of these forces and some of these stories uh, that uh, have been told over a long period of time.